All right. Okay. So I'm going to take a stab at this one because uh, let's just say Deleuze and Guattari are by no means accessible. Um, but with that being said, I've done had to do, and I normally try to avoid doing um, secondary type research because I like to stick with the, the text itself, at least when I'm talking about it here. Uh, but th with this text, I've had to, you know, really get, get all the ammunition I could before approaching it. So, of course, this is Antiedipus, and we'll start with chapter one. I don't know if we can, if we make it through, we might go into chapter two, but I'm thinking this will be a uh, four-part thing, you know, chapter one, because it's four chapters. Uh, but, yeah, you know, let's just, let's just get right into it. So this chapter opens up a whole kind of new nomenclature, uh, not really a neologism, because the word already existed, uh, but this idea called schizoanalysis or schizophrenia as being an opposing force i could say and it's, i'm going to deliver many words with reluctance because i feel like a very um uh, uh an adequate reader of deleuze and Guattari would have big problems with how i'm going to use some words just because i'm not you know fully versed in their kind of lexicon or even deleuze's entire Oeuvre, but oeuvre. Anyways, I'm just going to use words that I think fit in the moment. So, they open up this idea of schizophrenia as a means to oppose Oedipalization or Oedipus. So, for those that aren't familiar, you know, the Oedipus complex coming out of uh, Sophocles, well, not, the, not the, con the concept. Freud took up the concept from Oedipus Rex, uh, the idea that, you know, children young boys mostly want to you know overthrow their father take over to take their mother and then over the course of life as they grow up they get they then sublimate that desire into you know the productive faculties in the world they uh, revert their desire for their mother onto other women uh, they sublimate their anger towards their father into healthy cooperation and antagonism with other men but as we can already hear, or we can hear within that that idea, the Oedipus complex, we're dealing with very broad understandings of, you know, human organization. Where in the case of the mother-father triad, we have three very distinct poles, right? That is father, mother, and, ch and child. So Deleuze and Guattari almost right off the bat trouble that idea. So they say that there, there no given pole is simply a just uh, a kind of a singularity in itself. Rather, it is, it is comprised of a number of different elements. So this is what they call, uh, they are comprised of machines, in a sense. And all of nature is comprised of these machines. And it is in these machines uh, that we can trace desire, that we can trace libidinal energy, that we can trace anything like that where these things don't all, in the case of desire, libidinal energy, don't just come from this thing called the id. Unless, of course, we <laughs> attach to the id, that is the term, machine. So the id machine, that's maybe one way to understand it. So, for example, uh, as, he, as they write, the organ machine is plugged into an energy source machine, which is plugged into another machine, and another machine, another machine. So another example they give is that a mouth constitutes its own machine that is plugged into the nipple machine of the mother of the mother machine uh, and so on and so forth that feeds the milk machine into the child so everything can come down to this understanding of machines that is they work within production or they work by producing so what they say and this is on page three. So this does not mean that we are attempting to make nature one of the poles of schizophrenia. What the schizophrenic experiences, both as an individual and as a member of the human species, is not at all any one specific aspect of nature, but nature as a process process of production. So I realize I kind of glossed over this discussion of nature. 
they say that uh, a schizophrenic out for a walk that is in nature is a better model than a neurotic lying on the analyst's couch. A breath of fresh air, a relationship with the outside, with the outside, my God, the outside world. And they give the example of Lenz's stroll. So that was constructed by Bruckner. So this walk outdoors is different from the moments when Lenz finds himself closeted with his pastor, who forces him to situate himself socially in relationship to the God of established religion, in relationship to his father, to his mother. While taking a stroll outdoors, on the other hand, he is in the mountains amid falling snowflakes with other gods or without any gods at all, without a family, without a father or a mother, with nature. So this image that they're drawing here of a schizophrenic in nature, as opposed to a neurotic on an analyst couch, is that there is a degree of uh, almost possibility, but um, kind of a multitude of possibilities in this kind of natural landscape. But it's important that we don't romanticize this idea of nature, because nature itself can easily be co-opted uh, and kind of given a face that it doesn't doesn't have. But as a kind of general model and a, and a point of departure, it does serve a pretty crucial um, or a pretty useful end. So Oedipus does something to these machines. So it neutralizes them, or in their words, it presupposes a fantastic repression of desiring machines. That is, it doesn't want this discourse of machinic life of machines because that would signal like, like uh, an atomistic quality that doesn't fit within the broader narrative indicative of the Oedipus complex or psychoanalysis, even though I should say right off the bat, they make a distinction, that is Deleuze and Guattari make a distinction between psychoanalysis and the Oedipus complex, where they are really focusing on the Oedipus complex and don't necessarily want to do away with psychoanalysis. In fact, they, they're trying to reimagine psychoanalysis, but they, they kind of see no hope for the Oedipus complex. So one other example we could draw would be uh, Foucault in Madness and Civilization. There's a really wonderful, wonderful, there's a point in it when he says that uh, of all the problems, this isn't verbatim, but he says of all the problems of Freud's thought and psychoanalysis, uh, Foucault says that he at least allowed those people considered abnormal to speak. So they weren't just shut away into homes or shut away into clinics or, or mental asylums. They were actually given a voice in a sense. Which, of course, if we you know think about the later Foucault with the history of sexuality, we've come to find out that that giving of a voice is very problematic in itself. So in attributing a kind of value to this schizophrenic analysis, which they're saying is not necessarily anything new, they're saying that this is all, they're kind of just saying all we're doing is describing what is out there. If you look at the goddamn world, this is what you're going to see. So they say that schizophrenia is like love. There's no specifically schizophrenic phenomenon or entity. Schizophrenia is the universe of production sorry, of productive and reproductive desiring machines, universal primary production is the essential reality of man and nature. So desiring machines don't, or schizophrenia being that point that can then, or that thing that can understand the world or grasp the world, or essentially be in tune with the logic of the world that is not um, continuous, right? It's comprised of breaks. So this is a term that will kind of come up later. But if we go back to my the image I presented earlier that they, they give us between the uh, chi child machine or the child's mouth machine and the mother's nipple machine, there's always a break between the two. They can be separated, they can be disjointed, uh, but it's in that possibility that they make a kind of a perfect totality for that moment, but only for a moment, right? As long as that, uh, as long as one machine relies on the other. So for them, they continue, this is on page five, desiring machines are binary machines, obeying a binary law or set of rules governing associations. One machine is always coupled with another. So in applying this, I guess, this Ill imagination of the world, um, <clears throat> or the way they imagine the world, 
against the Oedipus complex, they suggest that the satisfaction the handyman experiences when he plugs something into an electric socket or diverts a stream of water can scarcely be explained in terms of playing mommy and daddy or by the pleasure of violating a taboo. So this Oedipal analysis that is reducing things to mommy and daddy comes later, right? At first, there was only desiring production. And this is a, an idea they kind of present later on in the in the third chapter, actually. But, you know, I'm, I want to try to present a really broad picture here that gets it all the, it's all the stops. Um, but desiring production has always already been there alongside social production, alongside the social machine, which can be understood as the kind of beginning for Deleuze and Guattari. Okay, now this is where it gets really wacky. Desiring machines, in the, or in the case of organ machines specifically, do not make up the totality of, of being, in a sense. They are not our full kind of ontological condition. Because those machines demand some kind of a non-place to be placed onto, then giving it a place, in a sense. And this is where I really want to preface that I, I hope I don't screw screw this up, uh, but I think I think I get it. Uh, but we're gonna try make sense of this here. So the thing that opposes this desiring production is the body without organs. So this is a pretty central concept in Deleuze and Guattari, especially when that you know reading this book, uh, Anti Oedipus, and then A Thousand Plateaus is a pretty necessary concept to get even though I can't say for sure I get it, but you know, that's what we got. So in the process of taking upon itself desiring machines, the body undergoes something of a crisis. So by taking on, you know, the finger machine, the lung machine, the heart machine, the the, the body becomes a kind of um, cathectic, cathected organization machine itself, where it comes to stand in even for organization, which is you know, can be really draining, right? We think of that old poem, I'm, I'm tired of being a man. It's kind of always inscribed with something. So they say on page eight, desiring machines make us an organism, but at the very heart of this production, within the very production of this production, the body suffers from being organized in this way, from not having some other sort of organization or no organization at all. So the body without organs opposes this kind of production. So they say that the full body without organs is the unproductive, the sterile, the unengendered, the unconsumable. So as they continue on the next page, in order to resist organ machines, the body without organs presents its smooth, slippery, opaque, taut surface as a barrier. So this serves as the basis for their, their understanding of the initial repression but they give the example of the paranoiac. So the paranoiac is the being that embracing a kind of body without organs resists all desiring machines from entering within it. So these desiring machines are necessary for a person to engage, you know, productively in society and within, you know, their own imminence of production. If I make, made that up. Um, and instead makes them a kind of indeterminate, uh, antisocial being to some extent because these desiring machines need to I guess exert themselves over a person before that person can exist within a social machine within a society machine or anything like that so as we might surmise being kind of a person that is not neurotic nor psychotic in this world would demand something of a give-and-take between the body without organs and desiring machines but underneath this, it doesn't give way to this kind of new being, right? There's always this antagonism at play, a kind of difference necessary to maintain that system, which is an idea that, again, comes out later in Chapter 3, and to kind of give it a little credence here for a sec. Um, they say that no system or no one has ever died from contradictions, verbatim. I think that's actually what they say. Uh, and that, in fact contradictions and difference are necessary to maintain a system because only when a system has the capacity to adapt to change to recognize things other than itself 
and incorporate those in a kind of uh, immunitary paradigm, like the human body, can it actually keep going effectively? So if a system was fully predicated on itself, it would push itself to its own destruction. It's kind of a logical conclusion. So there is a necessary relationship between the body without organs and these desiring machines, where, and I hope I didn't fuck that up. Like, this is so complicated, but uh, here they, they say on, on 11, the body without organs now falls back on desiring production, attracts it, and appropriate it, appropriates it for its own. The organ machines now cling to the body without organs as though it were a fencer's padded jacket, or as though these organ machines were metals pinned onto the jersey of a wrestler who makes them jingle. So the body without organs, being a kind of blank slate, is the space to record, which is another key term in their kind of book. Uh, the body without organs records desiring production in these desiring organs. Gives them a it's kind of the blank canvas on which they can be projected. So the great example that they give of this whole process is with a ju Judge Sherber. So J Judge Sherber was of the utmost interest to Freud and the psychoanalysts because he went insane, right? That quote unquote insane. He was uh, he identified as never himself more than one day at a time. Uh, who and he kept all these journals, I believe, when he was in. Uh, these mental asylums and it was just a really big case and one that was of the utmost interest to the Freudians so of <clears throat> of Sherber Deleuze and Guattari write that the psychoanalyst says that we must necessarily discover Sherber's daddy beneath his superior god and doubtless also his older brother beneath his inferior god at times the schizophrenic loses his patient and demands patience and demands to be left alone other times he goes along with the whole game and even invents a few tricks of his own, introducing his own reference points in the model put before him and undermining it from within. So like the entire how the body without organs, how desiring production, how, de how these machines all oppose the Oedipal narrative, they're suggesting we can do the same to any individual case, right? So this is also them setting the foundation for what would be called, you know, their schizoanalysis. So they take as Sherber not someone who's in need of psychoanalysis, because that's obviously too reductive. Instead, you know, they're saying that th this person is much more uh, tuned to kind of schizoanalysis. Now, I just to take a moment uh, to kind of outline an issue I have with this, it seems as though in their recognizing a kind of limiting component to uh, psychoanalysis, they seem to be supplanting it with their own in many ways, even though it's supposedly an open system, um, limited system in itself. But that's just that's just me. I, I, I still haven't been able to, you know, solve that riddle in my head. But just to put it out there, maybe someone has a has a, an answer to that. But you know, so the schizo being a subject like like any other uh, is designated like any other by being recorded on this kind of blank canvas that is the body without organs. So. These desiring machines are projected onto this canvas where they exist, where they be, where they operate as machines, and then that therefore constitutes that body without organs or that blank canvas as, you know, the space for the desiring machines as being, I guess, in a sense, indiscernible from the machines that are projected onto it. So there's a kind of like simulacral effect here where you have a kind of original canvas that is supplanted with some other uh, territory, some other map, some other mapping, and then that becomes what it is. But of course, it doesn't completely disappear. That would be, don't, don't want to think that. So recording then falls back on production, but the production of recording itself is produced by the production of production. Similarly, recording is followed by consumption, but the production of consumption is produced in and through the production of recording. This is because something on the order of a subject can be discerned on the recording surface. So it is a strange subject, however, with no fixed identity wandering over the body without organs, but always remaining peripheral to the desiring machines, being defined by the share of the product it takes for itself, garnering here, there, and everywhere 
a reward in the form of a becoming or an avatar, being born of the states that it consumes and being reborn with each new state. So we can certainly get the idea of how this was, a, you know, these are really radical ideas, even today, because they, people don't want to believe this shit. Uh, that is a kind of ambivalence in identity. And I don't necessarily mean it in terms of um, identity politics or anything like that. Uh, but an identity that is always already uh, negotiated because it's predicated on some very uh, volatile machines, very volatile um, components that, that give it its kind of essence. So this radicality is extended when we reconsider this uh, the relationship between two different machines, right, that form a synthesis. So between the mouth machine and the breast machine, is a synthesis but this disjunctive synthesis that is a break between the two or they're always already being a break creates an intensity and this intensity is what propels you know difference or propels change propels possibility in a sense so where do these pure intensities come from they ask so they come from the two preceding forces repulsion repulsion and attraction and from the opposition of these two forces it must not be thought that the intensities themselves are in opposition to one another, arriving at a state of balance around a neutral state. On the contrary, they are all positive in relationship to the zero intensity that designates the full body without organs. The schizophrenic within this whole framework, kind of being uh, maybe the subject attuned to these kinds of intensities, maybe, um, <coughs> undergoes kind of... Uh, a threefold process that for, forms a kind of trinary. And they are as follows. This is on 22, I guess, uh, 22, 23, where they say that uh, first is dissociation. So the schizophrenic locates the specific dysfunction or primary deficiency. Okay, number two, autism. So delirium or complete detachment from the world. Number three, being in the world. Discovery of a place in own specific world. So this formulation of the schizophrenic is one kind of pushed by what they call the materialist or material psychiatrists in a sense that they have a problem with, right? So while there, there is something to be said about its formula of remaining true to a kind of schizophrenic imaginary, they all point to this idea of an ego. So the kind of Freudian concept there, which they call... Uh, the, the final avatar of the soul, a vague conjoining of the requirements of spiritualism and positivism. So these steps or these processes, while interesting, only refer back to the eatable paradigm and are therefore a kind of closed system that is incapable of uh, recognizing you know anything else. So the ego, as they continue, is like daddy mommy. The schizo has long since ceased to believe in it. He is somewhere else, beyond or behind or below these problems, rather than immersed in them. So the Oedipal complex kind of grounded, territorialized the ego to some extent. So the ego was, for Deleuze and Guattari, and this is what I was saying earlier, they're kind of, um, they don't totally lament psychoanalysis. They say that psychoanalysis was in a sense good when it was focused on desire, right? Uh, and then when, you know, the Oedipus complex came in, then it totally grounded all these concepts where there, before there was a kind of malleability to them. So desire in this transition from the psychoanalytic paradigm to the eatable one um, under, underwent kind of a transformation. So at one time, desire wasn't necessarily understood as want for something some, some, someone lacked, right? And this is the classic problem of desire where it's traditionally understood as being want for something that you lack. So of this, they say, and I'll read this in length on 25, to a certain degree, the traditional logic of desire is all wrong from the very outset, from the very first step that the platonic logic of desire forces us to take, making us choose between production and acquisition. From the moment that we place desire on the side of acquisition, we make desire an idealistic, dialectical, nihilistic, conception, which causes us to look upon it as primarily a lack, a lack of an object, a lack of the real object. 
it is true that the other side, the production side, has not been entirely ignored. Kant, for instance, must be credited with effecting a critical revolution as regards the theory of desire by attributing it to it the faculty of being. Through its representations, the cause of the reality of the objects of these representations. So in opposition to this, desire should be understood as part and parcel with the process of production, where in it, you always are in the moving towards something other, right? Something new that you don't necessarily know about, right? And that's, I think, the difference where in the psychoanalytic imaginary, the eatable one, you desire that which you know about. Whereas in production, if we accept the world as desiring production, we always in this process, because we're never, you know, stagnant, moving into new things. But it's not something you necessarily have uh, a knowledge of, because that would totally go against the principle, at least the one that I believe is present in a thousand plateaus, when they want to do away with this thing called, you know, the subject, the, this thing called identity. What they, how they all, they illustrate this is by trying to remove faces or question you know why is it that humans are so obsessed with people's faces and that's because we've invested in the face the idea of a subject like that is who you are right we recognize you by your face but doing away with all this they open up a kind of radical potential for giving oneself over to this desiring production to the kind of flows the systems of the of the world in a sense so as they say on page 26, when the theoretician reduces desiring production to a production of fantasy, he is content to exploit to the fullest the idealist principle that defines desire as a lack rather than as a process of production, industrial production. This is because desire and the object that it's moving towards or striving for are the same thing in the machinic imagination. That is because they are both machines. Whereas in the eatable one, you have a subject, supposedly, that sees an object that will fulfill its fantasy, right? Or as, you know, Lauren Berlant kind of frames it, a kind of cruel optimism. Like, attaining this thing will make you, as a subject, better. So doesn't Guattari want to strip that away, suggesting that they are both machines? So, subject machine, if I can even call it that, uh, is part and parcel of a desiring machine that desires an object machine that, you know, moves in a kind of cycle. So in terms of a kind of egoistic uh, situation that is in Freud, so the ego kind of corresponding to the social contract in the sense, or you're being in society, uh, or you're being an agent in that society, in that world. I think I'm understanding that right. Uh, Deleuze and Guattari say that the social machine or social production is just another phase or another identity of desiring production under certain circumstances, or as they say on 29. Social production is purely and simply desiring production itself under determinate conditions. So in this social paradigm, it serves the interest of those in power. You know, I kind of use that term broadly. Uh, those in power to instill the idea of lack, right? So in terms of the fantasy or in desire or in want, kind of instilling lack into the people so that they lose sight of their being machines, right? Because suddenly if they introduce lack, they introduce objects that will ostensibly satisfy those lacks. And in doing so, kind of retroactively construct the human or the human, the subject as subject that is defined not in their kind of imminence, but in their being differentiated from the objects. So they, they, and I think I've made this fairly clear, they don't want to do away with all the kind of narratives present in Oedipal or psychoanalytic imaginary, that is fantasy or desire or lack, they, they just want to understand them in different terms. So as they say, so desiring machines are not fantasies fantasy machines or dream machines which supposedly can distinguish can be distinguished from technical or social machines rather fantasies are secondary expressions deriving from the identical nature of the two sorts of machines in any given set of circumstances thus fantasy is never individual it is a group fantasy and as institutional analysis has successfully demonstrated and art in many ways for them serves this function where art is on 31 uh, 
Art often takes advantage of this property of desiring machines by creating veritable group fantasies in which desiring production is used to short-circuit social production and to interfere with the reproductive function of technical machines by introducing an element of dysfunction, which makes total sense because that uh, doesn't totally oppose the logic of the social machines or social production. Because if we follow through with their claims, that is always already a system predicated on dysfunction, predicated on disjunctions, predicated on uh, breaks and ruptures. So introducing this art machine into it does comply to its logic to some extent, but in a kind of intensified form that opposes the organize, organizational trends of the other uh, systems. And this whole discussion of the kind of social paradigm or this idea of a group fantasy uh, leads them to say that, you know, the masses, in a sense, always wanted fascism because then it's, you know, they don't have to take it upon themselves to do the thinking because we are all, in a sense, geared towards giving ourselves over to something else in the case of machines, for example, that wrest us away from a kind of subjectivity, kind of individuality that is, for them, pretty repressive. Fuck, I hope I'm not like screwing this all up. I hope if I am, someone will tell me off. So things need to be organized to some extent, right? Things can't be left totally, you know, off the rails. So historically, the socius, so kind of like social organization <laughs> that is comprised of codes, traditions, anything like that is responsible for how they say code coding and recoding and decoding and so on and so forth the flows of desire so they have to be contained to some extent and they're contained within a specific kind of epistemic framework so in any given situation there are various codes traditions beliefs cultures identities whatever that comply to the limits of that system so this is the condition of the kind of quote-unquote primitive situation where in the pre-capitalist, pre-industrial, pre-modern, you had uh, organizations that were simply predicated on coding flows. So in any kind of given territory, that is how the flow would be uh, coded which based on the conventions of that territory. So they give two opposing examples to that. They give the example of despotism, which I think, you know, fascism or totalitarianism, that works by overcoding, you know, setting in very strict uh, guidelines that are kind of legislated. Uh, and then, you know, if you don't comply, you're going to get owned. And then they oppose it with the capitalist machine. That is the one that uh, decodes, right? So there doesn't seem to be any kind of conventions or rules or laws or anything like that, where there's a kind of free flow of anything which they don't totally admonish. They, in a sense, both celebrate it and, you know, caution against it because, you know, it does, in a sense, speak to the very logic of these machines that don't ascribe to a set code, per se, except the code of machines themselves, which are indeterminate. Um, so in that sense, it kind of speaks to these this system, but they do, and this is especially in Thousand Plateaus, they are a little bit, concerned about it or just put it in their terms here uh, under deterritorialization so in within capitalism uh, the real is not impossible it is just simply more and more artificial so in this system in this capitalist framework where there is this decoding of the flows of desire what we see are the developments of and this is a term that Maurizio Lazzarato uses. I don't know if anyone else uses it, but I'm taking it from him. Uh, we see the emergence of compensatory, com compensatory territories that serve the end of satisfying our desire for various territories through various repressive institutions. So then we get, uh, we get territorialized by the family, by the state, by you know the school, by the hospital, by whatever you want, um, that that are all responses to the decoded flows of advanced industrial capitalism, 
so that people don't feel totally, you know, out of their element. And Oedipus is in many ways just another response to that, is another compensatory uh, territory that seeks to ground the world in its, you know, daddy-mommy triad, daddy-mommy-child triad, in order to make the world more accessible, right? To make it make more sense, when in fact this world is, you know, to use one of Baudrillard's terms, uh, kind of achieved escape velocity and, and is now floating off into the, the ether. So then we get into the syntheses, which is the most complicated part of this for me. And I want to try and understand it in the way I can understand it. So, okay. The three syntheses are as follows. First, you have the connective synthesis. Second, you have the disjunctive synthesis. And then third, you have the conjunctive synthesis. Now, these may seem kind of um, oxymoronic, paradoxical, where you have a disjunctive synthesis. What is what is that? How do you have a disjunctive synthesis? Well, I need to turn to uh, Hegel and Marx to try and understand this one, or at least this is how I think I understand it. So, and I'm taking this idea from G. A. Cohen, who writes about Hegel and Marx's uh, dialectical configuration. So, what Cohen says is that in Specifically, let's talk about Marx. You have three stages. So you have the pre-capitalist, capitalist, and then communist. Now, I want to say before I go further that I don't think there's a clear, uh, there's a smooth transition from what I'm about to outline and the one that Deleuze and Guattari put forward. But I think it's a good point of departure. So you have these three stages, right? Pre-capitalist, capitalist, and then communist. So the pre-capitalist logic was guided by a logic of undifferentiated unity. The capitalist one was guided by a logic of differentiated disunity. And the third one, communism, guided by the logic of differentiated unity. So the same can be observed in Hegel, right? Where, you know, there's the recognition in the second phase of, a, of recognizing self and other, or the distinction between self and other. So this differentiated disunity, where there's kind of breaking apart, before arriving at the um, kind of collective recognition of selves in relation to other selves as other, which then can form their own kind of community of individuals, community of selves. So I think we can understand this in similar terms here. So there, uh, what Deleuze and Guattari give us, the connective synthesis, so that can relate to the undifferentiated unity, so that's where people are totally, you know, one and one and the same with one another. Number two, disjunctive synthesis, where you have different, uh, sorry, differentiated disunity, where they are not connected, nor do they subscribe to an overall uh, same formula. And then third, a conjunctive synthesis that corresponds to the, the maintenance of a kind of individuality that is, you know, under the same rubric. So I think we can apply these syntheses to the broader movements of history, in a sense, where you have um, the kind of uh, savage, quote-unquote savage, primitive ones corresponding to the connective synthesis, where, you know, they are just coded in their, in their codes. Uh, the disjunctive one corresponding to a more uh, industrial, kind of imperialistic one. And then the third one, conjunctive synthesis being the advanced kind of capitalist one, I think, right? And I really want to stress my uh, ignorance of this because it's so difficult. So to kind of make sense of this, I'm going to turn to another text, which I don't like doing, but this person is pretty can believe believes what they're doing is correct uh so this is steven shaviro you can google this it's uh oh, what is it called um the connective and disjunctive syntheses it's pretty clear i guess so he says the first uh the first synthesis the connective synthesis of production can be identified with the actual labor process that is to say with purposeful activity that transforms the world so um 
This is the universal primary production, in the course of which human industry has a fundamental identity with nature as production of man and by man. So strictly speaking, this process is not, or is not yet, subjective. Okay, fair. I think we're corresponding still to this kind of primitive idea. So within that paradigm, you always already have then the disjunctive synthesis, which is for them the, the synthesis of recording, which both organizes the connective process and, appropriate its prod and appropriates its products. So in the connective synthesis, there is no need to distinguish between production and its product. The pure thisness of the object produced is carried over into a new act of producing. But in the disjunctive synthesis of recording, the product is taken out of the flow, separated from the production process of which it was a part. This is what transforms it into a commodity, and it's pure thisness. It was an ordinary sensuous thing, but as soon as it emerges as a commodity, it changes into a thing which transcends sensuousness, Marx says. So in this process, the first connective synthesis is branched upon and subordinated to the disjunctive synthesis. This is why capitalism presents us with a fetishistic, perverse, bewitched world in which the apparent objective movement of the full body of the socius appears to us as the motor of social reproduction. Although the disjunctive synthesis depends both logically and materially upon the connective synthesis, it always appears as if the second synthesis came first, and this appearance is itself a basic principle of social organization and social production. So then finally, according to Shaviro, the connective synthesis of production is presubjective or transubjective. So the disjunctive synthesis of recording is estranging and asubjective. It is only in the third synthesis, the conjunctive synthesis of consumption, that something on the order of a subject can be discerned for the first time. The su this subject is not the traditional philosophical one. It is too insubstantial, too fleeting and transitory. It emerges abruptly and unexpectedly, and it, it dissolves just as quickly. So when feeling swells beyond a certain point, so that a threshold is crossed, a subject is precipitated into existence. So I think, oh my god, I think... Uh, this is like like when blood flows into the heart, like the the heart expands and then, then the blood rushes in and then it pushes it out, rushes in, pushes it out. Like that is a subject. Like the subject goes in in these fleeting moments and then disappears and comes in and disappears. So in this process of becoming a subject, even in the last stage, the conjunctive stage, synthesis, they, they are never a subject for more than a moment, right? That that idea of subjectivity is is out the window. But I, I hope that, and it's kind of a lazy uh, thing to do for me to explain it by presenting other ideas, but I, you know, he probably says it best. So, but to return to Deleuze and Guattari again, they say of the, the syntheses that they correspond to three different uh, movements, right? So the first is the production of production. The second is the production of recording. And the third is the production of consumption. Right, where consumption, I would assume this is where the subject comes in, where you can't have consumption unless there's a subject consuming, something consuming, right? But it would seem as though then machines could be very subjective, or can be subjects, because the machine is, you know, consuming what it needs to keep operating as a machine. This is this is also present in Marx, in the Gundrissa, right, where he says that uh, production is always already consumption and consumption is always already production where you have productive consumption or con productive consumption and consumptive production right so the producing agent the laborer needs to consume in order to produce and consumption can only be consumption by being produced so uh, that is i think that's how it works so the at best we are looking for like ruptures and breaks and disjunctive syntheses and you know inconsistencies. We are not looking for totality totalities that they tell us. And they give us the example of Melanie Klein, who they said, you know, identifies all these what they call partial objects, but then ascribes them to uh, the logic of the totality. And this reducing to totality serves the end of maintaining power in the hands of some, right? Because it turns the world or it makes the world susceptible to a totalizing narrative that is of daddy mommy through this eatable narrative that can ground people in a sense it territorializes them into the narrative or into the idea that you know those in power can then benefit off of holy god okay i think that that will wrap this up 
um, there's, there's more to it here, obviously, than I could get to, but it's so difficult and not, you know, this is, I'm trying to demonstrate my humility, uh, because, you know, I can't say I know this stuff for sure. I just happen to be reading it and, you know, I could put content up here. So I didn't want to lose sight of that or didn't want to miss that opportunity. But for those that listened, I would certainly hope you'd tell me where I went wrong. Uh, you know, correct me where I'm wrong. You could be as mean as you want. I don't give a fuck. You do whatever you want. Uh, but, you know, as long as I learn. But on that note, for those that listened, 